has the technology, the camera is nearly ubiquitous in the industrialized world, carried by almost every citizen and able to record events as they happen. While its history is not long when compared to many, one cannot overstate its profound importance in framing the modern world and shaping our understanding of it and what takes place in it. Less than 200 years old, it has gone from an inexpensive, dangerous, and messy curiosity to something most of those listening to this carry around with them every day. The first use of lens and film to document an image was done by Joseph Nicephor Nippes in 1826. The first self-portrait was made in 1839 by Robert Cornelius of Philadelphia. The first photograph was taken from the air in 1860, while the first color picture was taken by James Clerk Maxwell in 1861. The first major cultural impact the technology would have would be in recording images of soldiers and battlefield scenes during the American Civil War, literally bringing home the tragic consequences of the increasingly technological nature of armed conflict in a way never seen before. Of course, astronomy has been profoundly influenced by the ability to record photographic images since the first picture of the moon was taken in 1840 using a 5-inch refracting telescope as the objective lens. The sun's image would be recorded just five years later. In 1872, Henry Draper would record the first photographic spectrum, a technique that would have profound consequences in the field of astrophysics. 1887 saw the beginning of the first photographic astronomical catalog with the invention of dry pellate photographic techniques. The first photograph from space was taken by a V-2 rocket launched in 1946, and the first image of the Earth taken from the orbit of another astronomical body was made by a lunar orbiter in 1966. For those old enough to remember, the first images beamed from the Apollo 11 astronauts of the blue and white gibbous Earth rising over the barren landscape of the lifeless lunar surface forever changed how humanity saw itself. My mother used to tell me that when she watched that particular footage came back, she began to cry, overcome with the emotion of just how small and fragile our tiny world seemed. Many commentators suggest that it is this image that is responsible for the birth of the modern ecological movement. And while the first digital photograph was taken in 1957 at IBM, the digital camera would have to wait until 1975 when Eastman Kodak's Steve Sasson paired the recently invented CCD or charge coupled device technology with the necessary computer processing power to produce images with sufficient clarity and then store that data that made up those images on a cassette recorder. It would take another 15 years before a commercially available product was made available by the Logitech Photomen Company. By the early 1990s, digital photography had replaced dry plate technologies in astronomy due to numerous technical advantages. This, however, was not originally a cheap solution, and I can recall a speaker at a colloquium I attended during graduate school in the early 90s telling us that his research group was using a one megapixel camera that had cost $10 million to build. Today, even the cheapest cell phone made has a camera with a greater number of pixels than that. And though the last two centuries have seen enormous innovation in how the images are recorded, there is one thing that has remained constant. The basic construction of the camera around an aperture, usually containing a lens. How far does that technology go back? According to some, the first thing that might be called a camera, known sometimes as a camera obscura, was first developed by a reclusive Persian from the city of Basra, working in the desert outside of Cairo in Egypt. However, for Ibn al-Hatham, the camera wasn't the point of the work. Understanding the nature of light was. In his systematic quest to know more about that which made all things visible, he moved the science of optics forward far beyond the initial investigations of Ptolemy and others of the Greco-Roman world. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we make land on the banks of the Nile River to consider the work of the greatest physicist to live in the two millennia between Archimedes and Isaac Newton. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. <music>
Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 9.1, Supplemental. Abin al Hatham. Abu Ali al Hassan ibn al Hatham was born in Basra in what is now southern Iraq around 965 CE. Not much is known about his early life, but it seems that in his youth, he studied the sciences and became something of a prodigy. His access to an excellent education suggests that his family may have been wealthy and reasonably well-connected, a view supported by his gaining a position in the local government at a fairly young age. While the sources I have are not in complete agreement on this, it seems that he was eventually made the mayor of Basra, a job he seems to have had a little patience for as it took too much time away from his research and studies. There is some evidence that he may have been dismissed from this post due to claims of mental illness, though this may not be exactly as it seems, as we shall see shortly. Whatever the reason may have been, the loss of the position allowed al Hatham to return to the work he loved, thinking about and writing on science, something he did well enough to begin to be known outside of the region around Basra. At around the turn of the millennium, he wrote a treatise on solving a problem that got some very important people very, very interested. One of the perennial problems with the Nile River was that its flood drought cycle was enormously disruptive to those farmers attempting to use more advanced forms of agriculture. al Hatham recognized that if a dam could be built with an associated reservoir system, the late summer and early fall floodwaters could be stored for use during the dry seasons. His treatise suggested that such a project was feasible and the new rulers of Egypt were very, very interested. While Egypt had once been part of the larger Abbasid Caliphate, a family claiming direct descent from the Prophet laid claim to the region and threw off the rule of Baghdad. This Fatimid dynasty came to power in around 909 CE, and by this time had established a beautiful new capital at Cairo, complete with its own center of learning and scholarship to rival the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. At the time the treatise was written, the Caliph of Egypt was a man by the name of Al-Hakim Bimir Elah. He was sometimes called the Mad Caliph due to his seemingly erratic and capricious orders and demands, though it's really more likely that he was more imperious than insane. In any case, when Al-Hakim heard of the renowned scholar's interest in the project, he invited him to Cairo. We don't know if Al-Hatham accepted based on some sort of offer he couldn't refuse, or if the idea that he would be able to work in a city as culturally advanced as Cairo was irresistible. But, whatever the reason, he relocated to there in around 1010 CE. Once he got there, however, he realized that he had a huge problem on his hands. When he had made his pronouncement regarding the damming of the Nile, his experience had been with the much less impressive Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Upon seeing the Nile, he realized there was no way the technologies existed that would allow the job to be done. In fact, it wouldn't be until 1970 that the Aswan Dam project would actually realize the dream of controlling the Nile. This meant, however, that al Hatham had a huge problem on his hands. He had sort of promised the Caliph a dam, and he wasn't going to be able to deliver. And as we said earlier, the Caliph wasn't seen as the most patient and understanding of men. Such a failure to deliver on the promise could well cost the scholar his life. Now once again here, the sources are pretty unclear as to how he got out of the situation. He may have been arrested and imprisoned for a time, or he may have had to pay a hefty fine, but the most common story I found is just a little bit different. According to some biographers, Al-Hatham went mad. Well, at least he pretended to. 
and seeming to come unhinged due to the project, Al-Hatham supposedly elicited the mercy of the mad caliph who spared his life and either had him committed to an asylum or placed him under house arrest, an arrangement that would last until the ruler of Cairo died. And if this seems a bit cruel, it should be noted that by all accounts, Al-Hatham preferred the peace and quiet of solitary work that allowed him to read, study, think, and write without interrupting or needing to provide a living for himself while he worked. Aside from a failed engineering project, what did al Hatham do with all of his time, both before and after his move to Cairo? Now as a side note here, there's an old engineering joke that I'd like to share. There's a long running and mostly friendly rivalry between physicists and engineers where the physicists generally rib the engineers about not understanding any of the equations they use, while the engineers respond that at least the stuff they build actually works. The joke told from the engineering perspective goes something like this. An old engineering professor was asked to describe each of the scientists to a young student he was advising. He responded by saying, quote, if it moves, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. And if it doesn't work, well, that's physics, unquote. al Hatham's damn problem is a pretty strong argument for the engineer's perspective. Actually, as a physicist, al Thom did a lot of things that did, in fact, work. His greatest work was known as Kitab al manathir or the Book of Optics. If descriptions and causes of motion, known as kinematics and dynamics, have been one of the main topics of physics, the other was the study of light and its interactions with the things found in the natural world. The earliest studies of optical systems date back to the early Mesopotamians, who made crude lenses out of quartz and other things. There is some evidence that the Egyptians also placed lenses in the eyes of their statues in imitations of the lens of the human eyeball, perhaps hoping to give sight to their depictions of the gods. As with many things, it was the Greeks who seemed to have studied optical systems most systematically, with both Plato and Euclid writing important treatises. They showed that light rays traveled in straight lines, and that when a beam or ray of light hit a flat mirrored surface, something like a brightly polished piece of silver or tin, the light was reflected away from the surface at the same angle it was incident upon it, something we now call the law of reflection. From this, it can be shown that mirrors could be shaped so that light rays that originated from a source a long distance away, say from the sun, could be focused to a single point. An oft-told story about Archimedes is that he used curved mirrors to focus the light of the sun on Roman ships in the harbor of Syracuse of Sicily during the Second Punic War to set them on fire. Viewers of the popular TV show Mythbusters will know that this particular claim has been tested on two separate occasions, and in both cases, the claim was shown to be busted. They found that the ignition temperature of a large mass of wood was too high to be achieved by focusing the sun's light, even on a bright, cloudless day. One hypothesis about the origin of the story, then, is that Archimedes actually used the mirrors to blind the Roman sailors, and then, defenseless, their ships were disposed of in the usual way, by being rammed by Syracusan vessels. Another idea is that the Romans may have used a substance on their sails that made them particularly flammable, and it was this substance that Archimedes was able to ignite. If this second hypothesis is true, we've not been able to determine what that substance might have been. So to return to our story, it was Ptolemy who published the most comprehensive work of the Greco-Roman world on the subject, simply known as optics. One of the things discussed at length in the book was the phenomenon in which light was bent as it passed from one material to another. You may have seen this phenomenon with something like a straw in a glass of water or a pole attached to a net in a swimming pool. If you looked at the pole or the straw, it looks like it gets bent 
as it goes into the water. Now obviously it's not the pole of the straw that's being bent, but rather the path of the light ray originating from the object as it exits the water into the air. Ptolemy created tables of angles of incidence and transmission for various transparent substances like water, quartz, and amber. By comparing those, he was able to come up with a relationship between the two angles for each material as long as the ray of light hit the surface of the material within about 15 degrees of the perpendicular. If the angle was bigger than that, his relationship didn't work so well. He was, however, able to show that each type of material had a unique property that determined how much the light ray would be bent as it passed from the air into the material, something we now call the index of refraction. As with other topics, there wasn't much progress after Ptolemy's work until an Islamic scholar by the name of Abin Saul published a manuscript by the title of On the Burning Instruments. The focus of the book was how one could concentrate rays of light using either a mirror or a lens to cause combustion, kind of like Archimedes had tried to do. Originally written in around 984 CE, we only had various parts of the manuscript until the early 1990s, when historical researcher Rashdi Rashid was able to piece together two fragments of a manuscript to form an entire copy of the book. In doing this, he was able to show that Abin Saul actually accomplished working out the correct relationship for how light bends as it's transmitted from one medium to the other. The relationship turns out to involve not the angles of incidence and transmission, but the signs of those angles, and by signs here I mean the trigonometric function. For my listeners who are familiar with this topic, this is usually known as Snell's Law. The evidence discovered shows that the relationship was first put together at least 650 years earlier by a scholar associated with the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. The reason that this is important is that Al-Hatham built off the work of Ibn Saul in his optical investigations. One thing that should be understood about Ibn Saul's work is that it was mostly a mathematical treatise using various geometric and trigonometric proofs to establish the properties of various optical elements such as parabolic mirrors based on the characteristics of their shapes. What Al-Hatham sought to do was establish and extend those mathematical suppositions through rigorous and comprehensive experimentation. A few years after his release from house arrest, Al-Hatham published his own seven-volume book on optics that would become the standard reference work through the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution until the publication of Newton's work on the subject. It was used by both Galileo and Kepler, along with many others, to understand and work with optical systems. Volumes 1 through 3 took up the problem of what we might think of as light origination and transmission and its relationship to the human eye. At the time of Al-Hatham, there were a couple of hypotheses about how the eye actually saw things. One, known as emission theory, and held by such figures as Euclid and Ptolemy, said that the way we see things is that our eyes emit light on straight lines along cones that then interacts with objects we're trying to see. The evidence cited for this was the observation that unless we focus our gaze on an object, it remains blurry and undistinguished. While we now know that this is due to the way that the eye changes the shape of its lens in order to focus on things at different distances, the Greek understanding of the anatomy of the eye was insufficient to recognize this. Thus it was thought that if the rays of light emanating from the eye were not specifically trained on an object, it would not be resolved. A second theory was called intromission theory, and it had been held by Aristotle. This idea is that light is emitted or reflected by an object and then travels in a straight line to the eye where it's received and interpreted. Now an interesting part of Aristotle's specific application of this idea was that the light was thought to travel instantaneously through space when an distant event was seen. And that meant that observers at different distances reported seeing it simultaneously. A third hybrid hypothesis put forward by both Plato and Galen was that the eye emitted light which then bounced off the object and returned to be received, thus causing perception. This idea was also one 
favored by the early Islamic scholars such as Al-Kindi. Al-Hafam, in these first three volumes of his work, sets out to correct the picture. His first goal is to show that emission theory is wrong. He does this through the use of a number of rational arguments, including the damage done to the eye when staring at a bright source, such as the sun, for too long, the creation of an afterimage when eyes are closed after looking at a bright object, and by suggesting that it would be impossible for something emitted from the eyes to reach all the way out to the stars and the vastness of the heavens, an argument that had first been made by Aristotle. From this, he asks the question that if the eyes sent out light, how is it that they're able to perceive the object unless there's something that returns to them? This, of course, is the third hypothesis. But he then dispatches that by saying that if what is really required for perception is for light to come from an object and enter into the eye, why would it be necessary for the eye to send out light in the first place? If perceiving comes about, from the eye, or in the ear in the case of sound, receiving light, the method by which the light got to the object is immaterial to the process of sight. Thus, the simplest theory is one in which the light doesn't come from the eye, but from any number of other sources. Here we see Al-Hatham use something we call Occam's razor to really good effect. Occam's razor says, quote, one should not multiply entities unnecessarily." Unquote. In other words, if a part of an explanation for a thing or phenomena is not needed or unnecessarily complicates the explanation, it should be dropped. While the idea of parsimony in reasoning didn't originate with William of Ockham in the 14th century, we generally associate the practice of using the least number of entities in explanation with him because of ex his exceptional use of it in the theological debates of his time. Once al hatham has successfully argued for the intromission hypothesis for vision, he then sets to recasting the works of Euclid and Ptolemy in terms of rays traveling from the object to the eye through various media and optical elements. This is the subject of volumes 4 through 7 of the Book of Optics. One of the myths that results from the reading of this material is that al hatham is the first to associate the workings of a camera with that of the eye. It is true that he did work with something known as the camera obscura, and as we have said, he does spend a goodly amount of time talking about the eye's role in perception, but he never actually ties the two together, likely due to the lack of understanding regarding the anatomy of the eye we mentioned a few moments ago. At the time, it was not known that the lens of the eye formed an image on the retina, and so the idea of a lens of a camera forming an image on a screen, or later a piece of film, would not have occurred to him. This association between the camera obscura and the eye would have to wait some 600 years until Johannes Kepler reconsidered the idea. Even with that particular myth debunked, though, it is useful for us to talk about his camera obscura as it does form the basis for all modern cameras. The idea of this rests on the fact that if light from an object is allowed to travel through a small pinhole into a darkened chamber, it will form an inverted image on a screen or flat surfaces in that chamber. This was not a completely new idea at the time of Al-Hatham. It is said that Aristotle observed a partial solar eclipse using something like a kitchen strainer that made many images of the crescent of the partially blocked sun on the ground. al hatham though, is said to have created a dark room using a tent with thick cloth walls that were sealed at the joints and staked at the ground. In one wall of the tent facing the path of the sun and the moon through the sky, he created a small hole that could be easily covered. By sitting inside the tent, he could make clear, direct, and precise early observations of both bodies and, in at least one instance, did so during a partial solar eclipse. Moreover, he could examine the light from candles through a pinhole in a smaller screen of his own making inside of this tent. Through his optical analysis, he was able to explain how the camera worked and was able to argue that light would take time to travel through space something he said in contradiction with Aristotle. Another piece of work he did in optics and vision was to address the phenomenon that the moon appears so much larger when at the horizon than it does when it's high in the sky. 
The Greeks had thought that this was due to some sort of atmospheric refraction, i.e. the bending of the light of the moon by the Earth's atmosphere. Al Hatham was able to show that this was, in fact, an illusion, something that can be seen by holding a coin, say a penny or a nickel, at arm's length at the time of the moon's rising and then a few hours later. When this is done, it can be seen that the moon's size does not change appreciably. Actually, though, atmospheric refraction does change the size of the moon, but only about 1.5% in size, and actually even then, it causes the moon to look smaller at the horizon rather than larger. As al Hatham was able to show, the apparent change in size is due to the mind having distant objects on the horizon that are much smaller than usually seen to compare the size of the moon to. Since the mind lacks the true size of the horizon's objects, it assumes them to be much larger than they are and so scales the disk of the moon accordingly. This work, along with other experiments and explanations of shadows and lines of sight, was a foundational influence on the development of the rules of perspective that were incorporated into the paintings of the great Italian Renaissance painters Alberti and Ghiberti, as well as the Dutch painter Vermeer. Along with suggesting that light traveled with a finite speed, al Hatham said that the reason light rays were bent when going from one medium to another had to do with the speed of light being different in the different media. His analysis of this required him to break the motion of the light into components that were perpendicular and parallel to the surface of the medium, a method common in modern vector analysis. Additionally, in his approach to working with extending the laws of optics, he assumes light to be a continuous phenomenon, anticipating the wave theory of Christian Huygens. This led him to investigate what is known as the dispersion of light or spreading of white light into its various colors as is the case with a rainbow where small droplets of water act as prisms to bend the different colors of light by differing amounts. This work would eventually be more strictly systematized by a young mathematician, physicist, and alchemist working at an out-of-the-way institution in rural England. One, Isaac Newton. All of Thom's work in mathematics was usually done in association with his physical investigations. His best known contribution comes from the geometrical consideration of curved reflective surfaces and the reflection of light from them. Known as al Hazen's problem, after the scholar's Latinized name, the work is an attempt to create a way to determine reflection angles from a curved surface rather than a flat one in any general case. While the physical principles of the problems are basically the same, the curved case can't be addressed through the simple use of geometry. Instead, a rather difficult algebraic expression must be developed that is known as a quartic expression. When dealing with algebraic equations called polynomials, i.e. algebraic expressions that have multiple terms containing a single variable raised to different powers in its various terms, mathematicians name the equations according to the highest power of the variable of interest. In an expression relating a variable, say, y, to another variable, x, if x is found in the first power, i.e., something like the equation y equals mx plus b, the equation is known as a linear one because it produces a straight line on a graph. If x is raised to the second power, the equation is known as being quadratic, as every algebra student probably recalls after having to spend hours learning to factor equations in the form of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c using the quadratic formula. If x is raised to the third power, it's known as a cubic equation, while equations containing x to the fourth power are called quartic. This is the type of equation al Hatham derived when looking at the problem he had to figure out how to solve. 
In other words, when he did an analysis of the physics of how a ray of light would interact with the surface of a curved mirror, he came up with a pretty complex equation that was a polynomial with the highest power being x to the fourth. A complete solution to the problem is really complicated and wouldn't be fully worked out until 1997 by Oxford mathematician Peter Neumann. But Al-Hatham was able to come up with a partial solution using the mathematics of conic sections developed by the Greek mathematician Apollonius, who, as you may recall, was also the first man to show the equivalence of various models of planetary motion. Interestingly, by the time of Al-Hatham, part of Apollonius' work had been lost, and so the Islamic scholar reconstructed the work from other parts of the Greek mathematician's writings and then applied it to the problem at hand. Basically what he did is he ended up looking at how circles and hyperbolas intersected at a curved surface. He's also known to have done work in an area of mathematics known as number theory and was the first to establish certain types of relationships between integers. In the field of astronomy, Al-Hatham wrote about twice as much there as he did in optics, some 25 separate pieces of work in total. As we mentioned in the episode on Islamic astronomy, much of this work had to do with making refinements of Ptolemy's planetary models. He is among the first in his culture to suggest that the Almagest and other works not be treated as received wisdom and thus go unquestioned. We can clearly see this attitude in his response to a critic who had written to take him to task for expressing doubt that the picture found in the great treatise was wholly correct. Al-Hatham wrote, quote, From the statements made by the noble Sheik, it is clear that he believes Ptolemy's words in everything he says, without relying on a demonstration or calling on a proof, but by pure imitation. That is how experts in the prophetic tradition have faith in the prophet. May the blessing of God be upon them. But it is not the way that mathematicians have faith in specialists in the demonstrative sciences. And I have taken note that it gives him, i.e. the sheik, pain that I have contradicted Ptolemy, and that he finds it distasteful. His statements suggest that error is foreign to Ptolemy. Now, there are many errors in Ptolemy, in many passages of his books, and if he wishes me to specify them and point them out, I shall do so." Unquote. Not surprisingly, Al-Hatham then proceeds to do just that, revealing several instances where Ptolemy has gotten something wrong or introduced an error of some sort. As we mentioned in a previous episode, his book, The Models of Motions of Each of the Seven Planets, seeks to mathematize the entire picture of the motions of the planets. Let me see if I can flesh this out just a little bit. While Ptolemy certainly uses mathematics to describe the motions of things, that mathematics is really a tool used in the descriptions of the things themselves, i.e. the sizes of various deference and epicycles and such, needed to produce the various periods of motion of the planets. What Al-Hatham does is that he creates mathematical functions that describe the motions of the planets without reference to the mechanisms of the causes of motion. As an example of this difference, let's see if I can give you a different kind of a problem. Let's say I have a box that's going to slide down a ramp. One way I could do an analysis of this is to describe the ramp and its angle mathematically along with the various forces that act on the box from the ramp and the earth. I would then say that these mechanisms cause the box to move in some way. Another way I could look at the motion of the box is just to ignore whether there's a ramp or not and just express the forces as mathematical functions and then determine an equation of motion for the box. In a sense, Ptolemy does the first, while Al-Hatham does the second. In doing this, Al-Hatham divorces the motion of the planets from any particular cosmological model of the heavens. His system of equations doesn't depend on whether there are epicycles or not, or if it is the Earth spinning, or if it's all these spheres in deference. All that matters in his description is that there's a mathematical function that can tell you what the position of a planet will be at a given time. It's an abstraction of the physical system that, while startling for its time, will become commonplace in the physics of the 18th century.
Interestingly, Al-Hatham did not suggest that there is no preferred model when discussing the heavenly motions. Rather, he was explicit in his belief that whatever physical model was adopted to explain the observations must be plausible and work in such a way as to keep the various astronomical bodies and mechanisms from colliding with each other. In his own thinking, he clearly believed that the cosmos was centered on the Earth, and it is likely that his writings on this topic, as they were transmitted into medieval Europe, helped buttress that idea. As was the case in almost every thinker who considered the work of Ptolemy, he despised the idea of the equant and thus produced a model that eliminated it. As we will see down the road, this need to get rid of the most offensive of Ptolemy's innovations will drive a good deal of innovation in astronomical thinking. The final topic of this short biography will be a brief discussion on Al-Hatham's foundational contribution to the development of the process of scientific inquiry. For a long time, when someone discussed the development of, to use the historical but certainly inaccurate term, scientific method, they usually started with Francis Bacon or Rene Descartes. A few might go a bit further back to the ideas and work of Robert Grosseteste or Roger Bacon as part of the late scholastic period prior to the Great Mortality. In either case, the assertion is that what we think of as science began in Europe. This view has most recently given way to a more complex and comprehensive picture that while certainly acknowledging the great strides made by European thinkers, now understands and recognizes the foundational contributions made by classical Greco-Roman culture and, more importantly, the central role Islamic and Arabic science played in establishing those things that the European natural philosophers would build upon. In the medieval Islamic world, the tradition that led to this was known as shakuk, or doubts. In modern terms, it can be thought of as an attitude of skepticism regarding the received wisdom or knowledge. It began in the more permissive and open tradition of Al-Mamun and the early Abbasid Caliphs, but as later rulers became more conservative, especially in religious matters, it would be found towards the edges of the Islamic world, first in Fatimid Egypt, and then in Andalusia and across Central Asia. During the time period we are discussing here, in other words, the end of the 10th century and the beginning of the 11th, it manifested in the questioning of the works of the great Greek natural philosophers, such as was the case with Al-Razi, who questioned the ideas of Galen, and Al-Hatham, who questioned the work of Ptolemy. For Al-Hatham, the key way to proceed when one had doubts about a physical system was to undertake a program of rigorous and systematic experimentation and documentation of the results. While this may seem completely logical as an approach to us now, one should recall that during this time, there was a real tug of war between rationalist approaches to understanding the natural world and empirical ones. The rationalists claimed that the senses were not trustworthy, and so the true philosophers should work to understand the world primarily through the use of logic and reason. As the distinction between research-based inquiry and values-based inquiry wasn't clearly established at that time, there was a strong tendency one still seen sometimes today, to think that there's only one proper approach to ask and answer any important question. For the rationalist, that way didn't require any investigation of the natural world. In considering the work and writings of al we find a person who is very clearly in the camp of the empiricists, who, taking their cues from the writings of Aristotle, found their approach in a careful exploration of a system and then the use of the process of induction to generalize their conclusions. With Al-Hatham though, there is an integration of skepticism and empiricism that goes beyond what Aristotle suggested and thus is unparalleled anywhere else at the time. Moreover, 
we find a willingness to combine the results of experimentation with the deductive methodologies of mathematics in a way that would prefigure the process that would be put forward by Galileo six centuries later. As Al-Hatham writes, quote, We should distinguish the properties of particulars and gather by induction what pertains to the eye and what is found in the matter of sensation to be uniform, unchanging, manifest, and not subject to doubt. After which, we should ascend in our inquiry and reasoning, gradually and orderly, criticizing premises and exercising caution in regard to conclusions. Our aim in all that we make subject to introspection and review being to employ justice, not to follow prejudice, and to take care in all that we judge and criticize that we seek the truth and not be swayed by opinion." Unquote. Here we see a rational, even mathematical mind that, nonetheless, will not accept or believe those things which have not been investigated and confirmed by experimentation. This ethic, shared by others of al Hazm's generation such as al-Razi, al-Biruni, and Ibn Sina, will be transmitted first to Spain where it will trigger off what is known as the Andalusian Revolt, a continued willingness to test ideas and, when they are found wanting, challenge them, and then into Europe as the participants of the rising scholastic movement will read the works of Avaroes and others and travel to the centers of learning in Toledo and Cordoba. This skepticism and imperative towards experimentation will be part of what established the scholastic dialectic movement and inform the work of Grosstest and the first Bacon, both of whom we know read of and continued al Hatham's work on optics. As Robert Brifault writes, quote, The Greeks systematized, generalized, and theorized. But the patient ways of investigation, the accumulation of positive knowledge, the minute methods of science, detailed and prolonged observation and experimental inquiry, were altogether alien to the Greeks' temperament. What we call science arose in Europe as a result of a new spirit of inquiry, of the methods of experiment, observation, and measurement of the development of mathematics in a form unknown to the Greeks. That spirit and those methods were introduced into the European world by the Arabs." Unquote. I would add that in physics and astronomy, this introduction was by the way of the researches and writings of al Hatham, called by many the first scientist. enjoy this brief foray into the life and work of Ibn al-Hatham. He is truly a remarkable figure that is too often neglected when the story of the development of science is told. As an interesting note, 2015 was named as the International Year of Light, and that is in part due to the fact of it being the 1000th anniversary of the publication of al-Hatham's book on optics. For my part, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Jim Al-Khalili and his book, House of Wisdom, in bringing not only al Hatham's work to my attention, but for providing a comprehensive overview of the contributions of Arabic and Islamic scholars to the advancement of our understanding of the natural world. I would heartily recommend this book to anyone interested in the topic. Also, if you're enjoying the material we've been covering, I'd recommend you heading over to the Curious Minds podcast. Ron Levy and his team have started a series of short episodes on astronomy you might enjoy. What I think you all might enjoy even more, though, is the episode titled Marine Navigation and the Silly Islands Disaster. It dovetails nicely with some of the things we've been talking about and will soon be talking about. Finally, if you can, Please take some time to leave a review or positive comments for the show on any service you happen to use and let others know about us as well. Remember too that we're looking for recommendations for our three best episodes to submit for consideration for the Science Media Awards. You can leave your nominations on our Facebook page or over at the podcast website, the Scientific Odyssey, 
www.typepad.com. Next week, we'll take a look at how the scholars of medieval Europe are doing as their civilizations recover from the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the centuries of conflict and strife that follow it. Astronomy doesn't die there just because the political entity is unraveled and as Charlemagne tries to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, the need to track time and the desire to understand the heavens will soon drive scholarship back to the works of Aristotle and Ptolemy. Until then, full sails on your journey.